What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Don't forget, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and make sure you share the video. Got a brother on today, man, did well over 20 years in prison, both state and federal. Been through some stuff. He was in federal prison when shit was real, when it was really real. I mean, it's been real, but it was really real. But you know what? I'm going to let Flint introduce himself. Flint, tell the people who you are, tell them where you're from, and talk a little bit about how you ended up in prison, man. Well, uh, my name is Reverend Flynn. Nobody wants to settle in North Carolina. Uh, I did majority of my time, or well, majority of my life inside and out, inside institutions, started with reformatory schools, owned up into youth centers and, and adult prisons. Uh, I first went to adult prison for armed robbery, did seven years on it, got out, Caught two murder charges, a uh, second degree murder and a voluntary manslaughter. Pleaded out to 15 for second degree murder, three years for a voluntary manslaughter. And I was about in the sixth year of that sentence. And uh, thought I was getting released early due to overcrowding in the state of North Carolina prison system. Went down to the record office and everything, set up in there for about 30 minutes, and becomes the guys in suits. And it gave me a federal indictment for conspiracy to distribute cocaine. Me not knowing the law or understanding the law, I blew, I went to trial in a blue trial, caught 294 months at the expiration of the 18 years. Say I was in the force for a drug operation. Never got caught with any drugs or anything like that, but the murders took place at the particular drug house at six months apart. I was out on bond when I caught the second one. And it was a robbery that went bad on their part, you know, my part as well, because I got hit up, you know, shot. You know, that's how it all started. So I did uh, eight years in there and paroled to the feds at the completion of the, that sentence. So, Flint, let me ask you this, right? How much time did you do straight without hitting the street, man? 27 years. You spent 27, 27 years? years. You spent 27 years of your life. So, yes. So you spent 27 years of your life in prison, man. Let's talk a little bit about that murder case, right? Because it's over with now. I mean, you've already copped out. You pled guilty. What you say? It was a robbery. Went bad. Did you try to rob them? Did they try to rob you? You know, I think the youth need to hear no, this. They tried to rob me. Yeah, Paul. Matter of fact, you know, guys, I kind of like grew up with to some extent, you know, used to look out for them. They had some habits and stuff like that. So I used to make sure they had a little something, you know, every time I was done doing what I was doing, I'd break them off, make sure they had a little something. You know, this particular day or uh, the day before I had warned the guy, I said, I know what you're up to, don't come over there with that because it ain't go pan out good. You know, you need something, just ask, you know. And the next day or uh, he came and uh, by the fact I was inside the house, you know, God used to do things when he was outside selling and they went to rob him. And by the time I got out there, you know, the gun was pulled on me and uh, it, got, it got done and I caught the case for it, you know, pleaded out to it and, uh, you know, caught the time for it. These dudes put you in a position where they ended up getting killed because you were good to them. And they want to turn their back on you and try to take what you got. Jealousy, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's what goes on. You know, that's what's going on. In a, you know, I was never into, you know, selling drugs and things of that nature until that particular time. And, you know, didn't know the treachery, the ruthlessness involved, the uh, backstabbing and, you know, all these type of things that goes on with being in the streets, actually. And, um, I didn't see it coming. And when it came, I was like, whoa, you know, really? So this is how it goes. And uh, that's how it went. And before I know it, I was back in. What was it? Two dudes got murdered or one? Two. Both shot. Yeah, both shot. Yeah. How many times? Once. They both got hit once. What was it in the head? Yeah. So now let me ask you this, right? Because I think it's an important message. How old were you at the time when that happened? I was uh, 28. 
28 years old, you're out there getting a little bit of money, man, and these dudes, these dudes you're supposed to be cool with, they try to rob you. They get shot in the head, and now they're both dead, and you're looking at a prison bid. Let me ask you this, though, because I need to know this. Did it affect you that you had to kill them dudes? What what went through? Did you feel bad? Was there remorse? What were you thinking in your head after it happened? Well, remorse came later. After it happened, you know, the adrenaline was flowing. I needed to get out of there well, on the first one. I needed to get out of there and, you know, figure out what I was going to do and where I was going to go. So uh, once that was uh, established, then the things started coming to me slowly. Wow. Here you go. What's going to happen now? Who I should look for? How it's going to pan down? I didn't think about exactly at the time. I didn't think about jail or prison. I just thought about getting away, you know, and surviving and, you know, this type of thing. So when I did get caught, apparently uh, evidently somebody told where i was at and uh my thing was well if the cops come then you know how if it happened from that point on then i then i was thinking i'm not going back you know it is fortunate enough it was a lady out there that uh talked on a bullhorn and convinced me to come out and i came out so when i got when i went to jail now I'm thinking, because the bars are closed behind me now. And I'm like, whoa, here I go again. But I stand a good chance because, you know, they found their weapon. They seen that a shot was fired from that weapon. So, you know, I had something to fight with. And, you know, my lawyer told me, just don't get caught, you know, with any drugs and any more weapons. And that I was trying to do. Then uh, six months later, maybe five and a half months later, another perpetrator. And uh, same thing, arguing over drugs. You know, the do's and don'ts. You know how it go. The do's and don'ts of selling drugs. You know, if you sell it crack, you sell crack over there. If you sell it something else, you sell it over here. And uh, it was just a conversation like me and you having. And he pulled on me, you know. And uh, unfortunately, things didn't work out for him. So you then end up before I get arrested for that, I got shot, you know. And that's when the door was closed for a good while, for twenty-seven years after that. Let me ask you this though: on that, so it's two different murders, so the viewers know at two different times. So this guy pulls out on you. You get out on bail or bond. You're out. Yeah. You get in another altercation. Yeah. Dude pulls out on you. He wants to rob you. You end up shooting him. Does he shoot you at that time too? Nah, this was this is a whole different situation. It's like four or five days later. So-called friends walk me to an ambush. Walk you into an ambush for? Was it over the murders or was it some more people trying to take some shit from you? Nah, oh, nah, they had got they had robbed somebody, and uh, the guy they had robbed, I went to him. I say, hey, they ain't what they ain't they, the way things go. And I say, whatever you was taken from you, money wise, I'll give it back to you. Uh for the other stuff, I can't, you know. I said, but here. Yeah. And uh he took the money and then he was like, nah, it ain't like that. I said, nah, just just take the money and uh, you know, I look into the rest of it. And everything supposed to be straight from that, because it wasn't my beef at all. And uh, the same guys that did it, we walking one morning. And uh, as we walking through the projects, all of us, I'm in the middle, two on each side, one on each side. And as you walking through the projects, they kind of, when we got to the end of apartment, they kind of like fell back a little. And I kept walking. Then I heard the gunshot. I said, whoa. Then I heard another one, each shot. It, it took a second shot for me to realize that this cat shooting at me, you know? So I pulled back and I had, you know, I was strapped and I throw something at him, throw a couple of things at him, but when I was throwing at him, I got hit. And he took on off. How many times yeah. they hit you? Once. What they hit you with? Uh, I think it was a, a 38. Well, but I know it was a 38 because it's still in there. 
right behind my heart. So after that happens, you end up getting arrested by the feds now, right? Or no, I get arrested for the state. I get arrested. And while I'm arrested in, you know, in the hospital and all that, by the time they come and get me, they done put everything together. They got some witnesses and stuff like that. You know how I go. And uh, that's when I got arrested in jail from the hospital. Were you worried that you were going to end up with a life sentence? Or did they have the death penalty back then? It's always a death penalty in the beginning. You know, uh, this is what you're facing. If convicted, you can get the death sentence on life in prison in North Carolina. And it was kind of like, it was undetermined on the self-defense kind of law type thing. I don't think they really had a self-defense law. Maybe they did, but I wasn't aware of it. But uh, in my case, uh, the death penalty was on the table. Then life was on the table. Then it went from uh, two life sentences to life at 80. Then it went from that to, uh, to 80. And I was gonna cop out for the 80. Cause then it would have been cut to 40. I work on the 40 and I got a shot at daylight again. But it just so happened, my lawyer came that day and he told me about that plea. And uh, he said, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna talk again. But I had it made up in my mind I was gonna take 80. But when he came back, he said 18, 15 for, Second three from voluntary manslaughter, I jumped all over it. He didn't want me to take it because he felt like we could have won that trial. And I told him I wanted, I wanted me to take the chance. You know, Flint, this is what I want to do, right? I want to take a second for some reflection. And I want some of these young dudes that are listening to think about what you just said, that you were ready and willing to take 80 years for two murder charges, right? So that you didn't end up with life and you would have had to do 40 years. But what you were looking at at the age of 28 was, well, I'll get out with good time, man. What, maybe when I'm 65, 68, and I'll get to be free again at some point? At some point, I think uh, I was 28, let me see, 34, around 49, because it was cutting the half in North Carolina. 80 was cutting the half to 40. You're working on the 40. Good conduct, like you said, uh, good time, game time and all that. Maybe about 23, 24 years. I'm looking at 49, maybe 52 years old. You end up with and a really you end up with a really good plea. You take that plea, you're in the state, you're doing your time. Was it dangerous in North Carolina State Prison back then? Yeah, where I was at it was. Yeah. In Maxim. You know, I was behind the wall, uh, in the farms. You know, both of them was, you know, dangerous joints. So death row, death row, I was at the house with um uh, death row units where they do death row at. Were they trying to were they trying to kill people in there back then? Stabbing, robbing? Yeah, all of that. Stabbing, robbing, rapes. All of it. And it really wasn't no, like I said, it was clicks, but it wasn't what whatever you was on the street, you had to be that inside. You know, it wasn't like you in for murder, so you know, you automatically get to follow back. You had to be whoever you was on the street. You pretty much had to be that when you got outside. And guys will follow back the secrets you stand on your own. You know. Doubt, I hear you. So you do your time, they call you, you think you're getting out early, and then they take you over to federal court. How'd it feel inside to be hit with that now? Well, when I got indicted, I, two years later, well, two, yeah, two years later, I was already in the control unit, right? I had a uh, stabbed the officer and I was facing uh, going back to street court then, but they kept it, they kept it inside the institution and just uh, gave me a uh, mass lockup then long-term lockup. This, hold on, was this in North Carolina where you stabbed the officer? Yeah. What you stab him for? Putting his finger in my face. How many, how many times you stab him? I think it was about nine. And when you're stabbing the cop, what's he doing? Is he trying to fight back? Is he running away? Is he screaming? Is, I mean, what's going on? Right. He's kicking. He he he. It was a kitchen steward, and uh, what happened? I was I was on pots and pans, but when Death Row come through, they closed down the yard compound and let Death Row come in the kitchen to eat. 
So I will always have some ready for a couple of them, you know, some extra cereal, some meat products, you know, stuff that they can, you know, smuggle back to the sales and have some snack on throughout the week. And uh, he caught me one time and warned me about it. So this particular day they had fried chicken. You know what fried chicken day is? So it's chaos, bad confusion. <laughs> so uh, Death Row came, and uh, I talked to the guy that was serving the chicken. I said, "Hey, when Death Row come through, let me get on the chicken." He said, "Got you." So when it came through, I went to this particular unit on Death Row came through, and I got on the chicken, and I giving out chicken and stuff that I had I already made them up. So I was getting them out and uh, kids just threw a cart. And he started screaming on me and telling me I should be in my work area, get back to the pots and pans and, and all this, that and the other, you know. When he said it, I didn't move fast enough for him, I guess, and he got to talk to me. And when he talked, when he was putting his finger in my face, telling me I'm going to hold if I disobey a direct order. So uh, a, little, a little guy that was working there, he was chopping up the ice. He had ice picks. He was block, uh, chopping the ice up. And uh, I went and got the ice pick from him and went back and started hitting him. Immediately. And, you didn't go back. You didn't think about it. You said, man, this man just disrespected me, putting his finger in my face like I'm his boy or something or his son, yeah. and I'm about to handle this business, and that's what you did. And that's what happened, yeah. And it's just so happened that a guy that was working in his uh, supply room came and grabbed me off of him. He picked me up. I mean, sh I mean, this dude snatched me up like I was paper. He was big Archie. I never will forget him. I thank him for that to this day. He snatched me up off of him and said, man, it ain't worth it. Don't kill that man. That's the police. He said, man, it ain't worth it. And this the whole time he was saying in my ear. Had he not intervened, you would have killed the cop and you'd have been on death row yourself, right? Possibly, yeah. Boy, Flynn, I got to keep it real with you, man. It sounds like you got a trigger finger, brother. Uh, you know, I do have a anger. I, I had one. I still got it slightly. But you, you, I lost a lot in my life, Jan. You know, I went... I lost my mother while I was I was I was 16. I lost her. I, I was doing a six month sentence. On four months, I was maxing it out. She died on me. You know, I ain't never knew my father, no brothers and sisters, that type of thing. So I was always over overreacting to a lot of things. Dude, I wanted to protect myself. A lot of it was out of fear. You know, and um. Uh, I ain't really never had anybody take up for me, so. But I always kept in my head when my mama said, if you can't beat them, pick up something and knock the brains out. And that's what I always did. My stepfather taught me that when I was a young man, a young kid, man. But you know what? Sometimes that thing there will get you in trouble. You know what I mean? Most definitely. Most definitely. And sometimes it really ain't worth it, and I want people to understand that, man. How, many, how long did you stay in that control unit for? I stayed in the control unit about a little over four years straight. Then I went to the long-term unit, which human contact a little bit. And uh, I find that in all, I did about six. And I found a made population. I think that affected you mentally and emotionally? Of course, yeah. Uh, solitary confinement is, is, is uh, I've been to the edge, man. I've been all the way there. I went to mental health and everything. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was, because I was enraged, not because I was crazy, but I was raging inside and to the point to where every time they would bust that door, I was trying to attack the officers and they was like, something got to be wrong with this cat. Bro. You know, because he ain't got no wind. They come in six, seven deep every time. But I needed that, I needed some contact. I need to feel something. And that's how I felt it. I understand that, man. Um, so now you end up going to federal prison too, right? You you get transferred over to the feds. What's your sentence in the federal court system? What do they give you? 294 months, 24 and a half years. 
24 and a half years for what? Tell the people what it was for. Conspiracy to distribute cocaine. 200 keys. For 200, 200 keys back then, they give you 24 years. That's on a cop out. If you go to trial, they're going to smash you, right? Yeah, I went to trial and got smashed. Yeah. So you didn't get caught with nothing. Went to trial on that case and ended up with the 24 years. And really, what it was was what we call ghost dope. They don't got nothing. They ain't got nothing. Matter of fact, when they all, when they raided the home businesses and all these establishments, I was already in prison. I read about it in the paper. And I said, shoot, glad I ain't there. But case, I was. Was that case out of Charlotte? Was it selling? About, was about an hour and two hours from Charlotte. I know where it's at. So you end up going to federal prison now, right? How old are you when you walk into federal prison? 33. So you leave the state joint pretty quick and you end up going to federal prison, right? Yeah, I'm right at 34, 35. Yeah. What's the first prison you go to when you make it to the federal system? Atlanta, USP Atlanta. Do you remember what year that was? Yeah, 97. So 1997, you go to USP Atlanta. This is when things are jumping, right? Had all that oh, stuff going on in Lewisburg with the whites and the blacks and yeah. everything's racially segregated. And you walk into Atlanta where it's where it's jumping. Tell the people about Atlanta in 1997. Well, when I first got to Atlanta, I had an altercation. And this is the reason why when you first pull up, you see that big old wall. I was used to the wall, but this was a different kind of wall. Cause the way they take you in, when you go through R and D and coming in, you got this long dog hallway, long dog hallway, and it's dim going down through there. And they talking crazy. CEOs already talking crazy. So when we get to R and D, they separate us. Like right? to put some guys over here, some over here. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm looking, but I don't know what's going on. So uh, they finally, it was a bus of about 40 of us. And they came and got on the 12 of us. And I was one of the 12. And uh, the separators put us in a holding cell. And uh, some of them went to uh, the whole over. I think eight of them went to the whole over. Me and, me and like, me and, uh, a Serenio and uh, two Northerners, we was uh, still in the holding cell. So then they came and got them, and I'm the last man in the holding cell. Now I'm hearing the conversation. And the CO said, well, he's going to the special housing. No, he said he's going to the shoe. And I said, uh, what's the shoe? He said, special housing unit. I said, I don't need to be going to nothing special. I say, uh, yeah, I say, uh, no, nah. I said, you better look at my paperwork. I ain't, I don't need to be housed with nothing special. He was like, no, nah, no, nah, uh, uh, it's the hole. I said, what I'm going to the hole for? He said, it's just how we do it. We come in, you go to the hole, we check things out and see where we go place you. And I was still upset about that. So anyway, went to the hole. And uh, two guys already in the cell, both of them from Florida. They put me in there with them. Now they're youngsters. So one of them say, hey, uh, OG, uh, you can have my bunk, man. You know what I'm saying? He said, hey, you ain't got to clam all the way to the top bunk. You can get my bunk. I said, nah, I'm all right. I, I, I can get on the floor. Ain't no thing. He said, nah, I want you to have it, man. He said, where you coming from? I told him. Told him how much time I did, how much time I had. He was like, whoa. So uh, anyway, they chilled out. They had the lights covered up, so it was kind of dim. So they went on here and chilled out. And I sit on the, I sit on the toilet facing the window where I could see the back dock of the kitchen. Before I know, tears were streaming down my face. And I was sniffing it. He said, old school, you all right down there? You know, they was all, but they called me old school. I'm like, yeah, how about I ask you sinus problem, man? I got these sinus problems. He said, no, nah, that's the 25 years you got down there. You just coming out the state. You feeling that shit already, huh? I said, yeah, man. 
He said, you gonna be all right, man. So he tried to give me a little school about what's going on on the yard and stuff. But uh, them tills, man, cause I felt, I felt like I was doomed, you know. I was already in my thirties and I knew I had to do at least about 20, 20 something. You know, them years cocking up on me and it was just fresh, man. I had just had a visit from my wife, my son, and he was still a little boy at the time. And uh, I was like, yo, this, this, this might be over. Cause my mindset had already went, went to a total different level from the plans I had when I was in the state. So when they shut the door on me in the fairs, I, I had I had already given up, I could say. You know, and uh, staying in the hole about two weeks. And they said, well, we're going to sign you here. Uh, my pre-sentence report had me going to uh, a FCI. But my record and my prison record had me, you know, we're going to keep you in the pen for a couple of years. And I'm staying in Atlanta 10 years, almost. Let me ask you a question, though, because you go into a cell in the shoe, and back then everything was overcrowded. I mean, there was a murder where, you know, this white kid that got murdered in the cell over there in Atlanta back then when he first came in. I remember his parents used to post stuff up. And if anyone knows who killed our son, please let us know, whatever. But you go into a cell that's really made for two people, right? Yeah, yeah, two bumps. And they gave him a of throw on the floor. Yes, I I, I'm sure you did. Now, let me ask you this. This is federal prison supposed to be so good, yes. but they were putting other dudes. Were there four or five people in cells at some point over there? At some, at some point, there was four. There was four. Sometimes there might have been five, but I know four for sure. You, know? you make it You make it the population. You're in Atlanta, man. I know there's a lot of stuff going on over there. Were you there when the ABs killed the Chinese kid? Do you yeah. remember that? Yeah. Only with um, they were, we were coming out with Tim in the move coming off the rec yard. You know, when I first got there, they ain't had Tim in the move. They was just you just go when they opened the door. But after the murders and stuff kept going on there, uh, they started having Tim in the move. Then it went to five minute moves. When they when <laughs> DC flooded, uh, when DC boys started flooding the feds, they made a five minute move. <laughs> <laughs> so well, well, one of the Chinese one of the Chinese dudes real good friends was a guy named John Powers. And John witnessed his best friend get murdered. He ended up in the ADX for 15 yeah. years, and he tattooed himself. He bit his fingers off. He drilled a hole in his head. I mean, this dude did a lot of crazy shit, but he was there then. What's some of the craziest things you've seen when you were at USP Atlanta? Well, when I first, well, the first thing I did was crazy. Uh, when I, when I, when they let me out of the shoe, I hadn't went to the, I hadn't went to the laundry yet, so I still had on shoe clothes. And it was child time. So uh, I went to my unit, dropped my stuff off in the cell and went to the child. I was hungry. And when I got in the child, you know, I, I ain't pay attention to the, the white, they had a white side and they had a black side and these tables, you know, uh, uh, white tables, Hispanic tables, black tables, gang, you know, all this crazy stuff. So anyway, I went to a table that was empty. And I sat down and started eating. And uh, guys, look, and I was on the white side. But you know, it was sprinkling out blacks and stuff too. <laughs> so I sat at the table that was up there. And this is how I met Sweet Matt. And um, he came over to the table. He said, he said yo, bro. He said, yo, let's come over here and sit down, man. I said, nah, I'm all right right here, bro. He said, nah, he said, it's best that you come over here. And I said, what's what's going on? He said, uh, nothing. This just ain't our table. I said, well, who table is it? He said, I'll explain it to you. Come on. So I went over there and I sat down. We started eating. And uh, basically started telling me, he said, hey, that's the, that's the white boy's tables. You know, the whole side right there, that's where they sit. GDs right here, Vice Lords right here, Crips Bloods right here, Dirty South over here, Northerners, West. You know, I'm like, whoa. So uh, I didn't, I wasn't feeling that. So anyway, uh, when I got to the unit and got my clothes, they had, they had red card. 
And uh, the worst thing I had seen witness was uh, the DC and his gunk killed the dude that died at the gym in the bathroom. Uh, Let me stop gump. you. You said a DC uh, and a gump? Yeah, his gump. Tell the people what a gump is so they know. Oh, homosexual. Yeah, gump is homosexual. And uh, the gump old man went back to court on the writ. So this other guy, you know, they was doing their thing. They, he buying the gump commissary and, you know, all this. Him and the gump having sex and all this. But when the gump old man come back, the gump tried to cut it off with him. Told him, say, hey, my man back. And, uh, you know, we got to stop this. But dude, they want to bag up. He kept coming at him. So the gump told his old man, you know, they advised the plan. Went down to the gym. And the gump had like he was going to take him in the bathroom to have sex with him. When he took him in the stall, his old man was there. And they butchered him. Drug him out. We was in the gym. We was in the wreck. Or uh, doing dips. I never will forget. I was doing dips and pull-ups. When he come running up out of there. Let me ask you something. Was that dude a little short dude from D.C.? Yep. I was with him in USP Coleman. And he, he didn't have, he had like 10 or 15 years and ended up with a life sentence over that. He yep, was in my life sentence. Yep. So did. Yeah, 10 or 15. Gump named CC. The gump was kind of Filipino. And, uh, yep. Yeah. He, so he's got a little right. short bid, 10 or 15 years, that he kills a dude over a homosexual yeah. that he was having a relationship with, and then he ends up with a life sentence, and now he's going to die in prison. Yeah, he's going to die in prison. So, uh, little short dude. Yeah, you're right. I, I, I call his name as we keep talking in a minute, but yeah, that was one of the situations. And uh, I'm in one situation that I didn't know how serious it got to. Uh, I started plotting to rock the guy to sleep to kill him all. Uh, a DC dude, I, you know, as I first went in and got frustrated, I was drinking, doing a little dope stuff. And I had, he, gave, he had gave me some bad dope. And he wanted, he gave me a commissary list and it was like about $200 on that list. I, you know, I wouldn't like that at all. And I finally told him, I said, man, I'm not going to pay you for that. And he said, well, I said, I ain't going to pay you for it. And, uh, so we had changed words. It was on the move. I was coming from the commissary with my bag, and he was out there waiting. So I came from commissary and went back to the unit, sent my bag up. And uh, I said, well, I'm going, I told my son, I'm going outside on 10 minute moves. I'll let this do. And uh, he said, you want me to come with, come with you? I said, oh, yeah, you can come, because it's like, he said, we need to load up. I said, y'all going to load up. So I load up, he load up, we went out there. And um, he went through his thing, and I went through mine. So they closed the yard. So the next day at work, at the time, I was working in Unicorn. And the next day at work, I went to work at uh, his part, one of the DC shot callers named Big Red. His name is Harold Roberts. Called him Big Red, though. We was all right. But uh, dude had went in the bathroom, and I told my partner, I'm going in the bathroom to see what's up. But when I went in there, I was strapped. The dude was strapped, but it was three people in the stall. The same one you talk about caught the light sentence for killing the, the, the girl. He was in one stall and two was his home. All three of them from DC. But it was me and him. And uh, so we had squared off and to do his thing. But about Big Red came in there and seen what was going on. And he stopped it. And he told he told uh, the, the boy, say, look, man, say, oh. Uh, Carolina, he, he's a man. You know what happened? He told me what happened. And he told me, he said, you know that shit wasn't no good. You know, and he's a man. He wasn't going to go for that, you know. So that guy squashed. But I seen more violence than I had to illustrate on. Thank God for that, because I was on some other kind of time, really, Chad. I was on, you know, revolutionary time, you know. And I knew, uh, I always knew who my real enemies were. You know, so you say you're real when you say I know what you're talking about. When you say you're real enemies, tell the people what you mean when you say you're real enemies, bro. A revolutionary my, time. My, my real enemies was the people that was housing me. You know, the government, federal government, and the state government, and those that worked for them. That's who I felt that my enemies were. You know, and I had seen how they would 
put guys in the shoot in the cell with their enemies and say, oops, after one of them get killed. When I first got there, they knew that it was a, a dude supposed to be AB affiliated. He wasn't no AB, but he was AB affiliated. He had to light the boats, the whole thing. And uh, they put him in the cell with a known enemy. And I think it was a dirty white boy, but they had been beefing. They wasn't, you know, the dirty white boy was a torpedo trying to get in with this AB guy, you know, trying to, you know, bond with them. And anyway, they knew they was beefing. They put them in the cells together and they ended up butchering each other. And uh, it was a couple of situations like that that I used to just see and wonder, you know, what mentality these people have in the feds so they even lose sight on, on what's going on. You know, so many people, Flint, let me stop you because so many people have lost sight. They lose sight of what the real mission is. Like I say, man, together we'll conquer as one will fail. We're too busy fighting each other, man. We're too busy worried about, hey, that's the black side, that's the white side, while the cops are spitting in our food. You know what I mean? Spitting in the food. I remember I was in the kitchen with, um, I worked in the kitchen with Nick and Scarfro, the boss out of Philly, and uh, he was folding napkins. That's what he did. He always folded. For some reason, he was always on silverware. And uh, I was sitting there, and I had brought him some, uh, there was something he wanted. I think it was some Danishes or something. Guy had gave to me the pass to him, and I brought him to him, and uh, we were sitting there talking. And uh, he was like, where you from? And I told him, North Carolina. He was like, yeah, it's good guys come out of North Carolina. He said, you, you quiet in the kitchen. Uh, you don't talk much. I said, nah, I said, really, Mr. Mr. Scarfro? He said, just call me Nick. I said, really, I don't understand what's going on around here. He said, what do you mean? And I said, oh, everybody just fighting each other, killing each other over, over stamps and, and stuff like that. I said, I don't get it. And he said, you probably never will. He said, don't try to figure things out. Just know that you don't want to be one of these guys. And that stuck with me, you know. And uh, I heard he had died. I didn't even know he had died, you know. But, uh, yeah, that stuck with me. And I, I was fortunate enough to run into good people. You know, like we was talking last night, Matula Sikor, he pulled me up before. And you thought he was a racist. I did, too. But uh, <laughs> but he he... he, he he was from a different era in time. You he know? was, yeah, because he knew who his enemies were. He knew, you know, he felt that, you know, his people were disrespected, that they were revolutionaries, that, you know, hey, look, man, we're not going to let people hold our people down. And listen, I, I don't I don't trip on no one that feels that way, man, about, you know, uplifting their people, man. There ain't no problem with that, man. If you're black and, and you want to uplift your people and you want to save these young, you know, black kids out here in the street doing the wrong thing, then all, all the power to you, man. The same thing to Hispanics and the same thing for whites. There ain't no problem with loving who you are, man, and where you come from. You know what I mean? Exactly. exactly. This is, but this is where this is where it needs to end, right? Where we can love yeah. ourselves, but we also have to love each other, man, and work yeah. together for a common good instead of working against each other. When we all lose and they win, they're still the winners. We're still the losers. Yeah, well, they're still the winners. You know, and and I find myself I find myself in an isolated place a lot of time. You know, I don't got over to waking up. You, you know, horrified and sweats and, you know, thinking I'm still inside. I done got over the insomnia to some extent, but the depression and paranoia, I'm still working on, you know. I want to ask you a question, though. Before We're going to get to that in a second, too, because it's important. I mean, with all the time that you did, you're the type of dude we need on the show. Tupac Shakur, that's what we were talking about. We're talking about his, his father, right? The man who yeah. raised him. What was he like when you were with him? Was he a good guy? Yeah, he was a good guy. All he did, well, you know, he stayed where he had, uh, at that time, they would let people come in, you know, from the streets. You know, he had uh, bands coming in. He had rap artists coming in. Uh, matter hey, hold of fact, on. He had, you guys, he had, did you guys have an African warden down there that used to look out and bring people in and all that stuff? Or was that yeah, Willie Scott. Willie Scott. You guys had Willie Scott. All right. Yeah. And, uh, but what? What happened, he had a rap group inside called the Solitary Confinement Unit. 
and these kids could rap, a conscious rap. And they was making CDs and this, that, and the other. And they was going out, you know, in the legal mail, you know, things like that. And he was getting on. Somebody told on it. That's how he ended up out of Atlanta with the Long Park. But what all he would do, he was doing black hours, he would run them 22 miles. First time I participated in it, I ran five and had to walk the rest. And <laughs> but as years went on, I got better. But all he would do is teach classes, teach kids. Uh, you know, he would he uh, a lot of guys had hepatitis C, and uh, he would he would do this thing with the cigars. Was folks when he could have cigars and stuff, and he would run the cigar up and down their legs to where the, 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 the fluid would come right out of their bodies. You know. He was um he was acupuncture. He was good at that. And uh he just stayed busy. He just stayed busy. And uh I remember I was going to get him for breakfast. I had a book that he had let me read, The Art of War. And uh, I was taking that book back to him. And uh as I was going to his door, he was coming out to sell. And I seen it in his eyes, but I ain't I could I didn't know what it was. But when I looked at him, he just kind of like grabbed my arm and pulled me in the cell. And when he pulled me in the cell, he said, shut the door. So I shut the door and you could hear it before you saw it. You know, the sound of like, like, like you playing in the gym on the basketball court, squeaking under sneakers. And uh, dude was getting hit up over, over radio. He had stole the guy's radio and uh, tried to send it back to him. Stole the man's radio and tried to sell him back his own radio. Unbelievable. You stabbed him from the day room all the way to the lieutenant office. So now let me ask you this, right? You end up getting out of prison after doing 20, what, 27 straight years. What's it like when you first walk out and you're you like, wow, I'm free. The gate just clicked behind you and you're walking out. What's it like? Well, when I got out, I went home from Ashland, Kentucky. And that was a struggle of, of his own. Uh, Chomo, Chomo uh, joint, uh, dropouts, ex, you know, cops and stuff like that. So it was a struggle of his own, but you had some good men there as well. So I went to the bus station and my wife, she and my son and one of her friends, they picked me up at the bus station. I suppose to caught the bus, but you know how it go. They came and got me. And uh, I ain't know. It was, I was out, but I had to be still to realize it. You know, I had to be still. I had to, because I, I, I wasn't sure somebody gonna pull up behind us later on, run us off the road, snatch by the car. And take me back, you know. <laughs> I wasn't sure. And uh when we when when it got real, first thing I wanted was uh something from to eat. I think it was McDonald's or Burger King. I think it's McDonald's we went to. And I realized I got teary eyed actually when we got to Virginia and my son got behind the wheel and started driving. Cause he couldn't even walk when I went in, you know, he wasn't even walking When I come home. He's driving. I can't even drive. I haven't been behind the wheel of my life. Almost it felt like, and to see him driving, man, uh, I, I, I realized I had missed some, I had, I had missed out on a lot. Man. And how old were you when you went in? You said again, 28 or 29, and then you come home at how old? I was when I went to jail, but I was 28 when I went to prison. When I came home, I was 56, almost 57. I want people to think about that because you had that state time, you had that federal time. Man, you went home, you went to jail, a young man that came home, in some people's perspective, an old man, right? Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, yeah I'm 61 now. Yeah. Bad that hurt, man. It did. It still hurt. 
you know what the saying was I heard or you got more time behind you than you do in front of you. I'll be having anxiety attacks, want to get so much done and then she be like, man, you ain't gonna you ain't gonna baby do it. You know, trying to come home to be a father, a grandfather, a husband, something I never was before I went in. You know, don't nobody want to hear that after break away. So what hurts the most is what? Not being able to be a father all them years and all the things you missed out on in life, right? Yeah, yeah that hurts. It don't hurt at the time because you're too busy trying to live to get back out here. You know, but, uh, go ahead. You, in, when you come in there, then you see it. And you see it every day. It never goes away. You know, it never goes away. And they, I remember when I was in Atlanta, my wife came to see me. And I was telling her about, you know, some of the things that was going on inside. And I remember her saying, well, you just stay alive. Don't worry about all that other stuff. You, you just stay alive, you know. And uh, that, gave me, uh, that gave me some energy to keep fighting, you know. And she worked on my case when I couldn't, and I worked on it when I could. And... You know, finally, uh, well, it was wasn't much of a break, but they took thirty, what, thirty months off on the end. You know, when they did the uh, two point reduction thing, yeah. They so you ended up months. filing. You ended up probably filing a thirty five eighty two motion right. two point reduction, and they reduced a little bit of your time. And I mean, thirty months is thirty months, but you know, you spent a long time in there, man. Yeah. And and you yeah. talked about some of the struggles that you have now. Now that you're out, what are some of the struggles that you deal with now? You've been out five, six years. What do you still struggle with? Uh, <laughs> yeah, phones, telephone, how to communicate with my wife, my son. Uh, get uh, I get upset because I'm confused a lot. And don't nobody, you know, really understand this confusion with me. And I, I expect them to understand it. But, you know, three decades, man. And you know, they it tearing down the house around the corner and putting two more up in a week. You know, uh, when I came home, I didn't even know how to get to my own neighborhood where I used to stay. Didn't know how to get around the city, you know? And and now they didn't have cell phones. They had beepers maybe, but they ain't have no cell phone. They didn't have this right here, what we doing right now, you know? <laughs> They just have a lot of stuff, man. And, you know, it's like, uh, and, and, and I think, I thought when I was released, I was ready. But every day I see I'm not. I wasn't. Let me stop you for a minute. You, let me stop you for a minute because I think you were ready. You were ready to be free, but maybe you weren't all the way ready to be able to understand everything when you got out here, but you were ready to be free. Oh, yeah, I was ready to be free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good correction. Yeah, I most definitely was ready to be free. I, I was not socialized. I ain't that. But maybe just, just confused. I, I just, you know how you want to do so much. You want to run a race. And, and you just want to do so much. You feel like you don't have ample time to do it, man. You know? Trust me. I, I was facing death inside. I faced it boldly. But now, it's like, I feel it coming, and it's just, it's just coming, man. <laughs> Listen, man, I'm going to tell you this. I'm happy that you're free, man. I'm happy that you're out here. You spent a lot of time, you know, you spent, like you said, more time of your life in prison than you spent free, but you're free now. And now it's yeah. your opportunity to live your best life. And you've been, you've been doing it because you've been out here five, six years, and you haven't been back, and that's what's up. But when you contacted me, it, was, it came across as, look, man, you were a young man when you went to prison. I respect dudes that been in prison like you've been in prison with Guy Fisher. I respect old school guys. You were with one of my real good friends, Cedric Dean, who's also from North Carolina. He did about 23, 24 years in prison also. He's out here doing big things. But when you reached out to me, I felt like you had a message to give, man. So before we close the show, we're going to get ready to close. But what is the message that you have to the youth, man? Well, your, type, your, your title, uh, Blood on the Razor Wire, and uh, 
to keep the youth from, uh, I can't say it verbatim, uh, from dying. Uh, my thing is, is that regardless of how much you up under, how much oppression it feel like, or how bad things may seem, it's not never gonna be near as bad as going and spending the rest of your life in somebody's prison. It's never gonna be as bad as, you know, somebody telling you when you can sleep, when you can eat, when you can bathe, when you can go outside and breathe fresh air. As long as you're alive and you're free, you can always stand a fighting chance. And if there's organizations, there's somebody that's willing to listen, go to them, talk to them, get involved, stay free. And most of all, stay sucker free. Because the same people that will put you in prison, when you get there, be the same people that will keep you inside. With that bravado, with that, you know, I seen so many guys that had a chance to come home that was two weeks short, two years short, right far enough for now. A guy was going home in like a week, Spanish kid out of New York. And uh, a guy killed him over some stamps, man. Over some stamps. And, uh, you know, whatever you face out here ain't near as bad as what you are facing there. You know, Flint, let me let me say this, right? Like you said, man, what is the I always tell people the moral of the story, man. What's the moral of the story today, man? It is what you said, man. Stay sucker free. You know, and, and don't be the guy that's got two weeks left. Don't be in a position where you got two weeks left and you get killed over a couple postage stamps. You know what I mean? Yeah. And sucker free is man, staying all the way out the way, man, living your best life, living a free life where you don't have to have someone tell you when you can shit, when you can eat, when you can sleep. And that's what the message is today. And, you know, I, I I hate this for you. I hate this, man, that you are an example to what other young men don't want to be. They don't want to be in the street where they have to put themselves in a position where they kill somebody and spend the next 27, 30 years of their life in prison. They go to prison and get out. Their son was two years old, and now he's a father and a husband himself, and he's driving you home from prison. That's the moral of the story, man. Stay home and be the driver. Don't let your son be your driver, right? That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, my son was four months old when I went to prison. When I came home, he was almost 28. Sad, sad you story, know, man. And uh, sometimes, you know, we have talks and I see that little boy in his eyes. You're all right, man. You've been through it, man. You're an example, man. But uh, yeah, uh, life is for the living, man. And now as you can breathe, you can achieve. As long as you realize that the struggle isn't to break you down or make you weak, but to give you strength and to be a leader for tomorrow for those that are not leaders today. That's my message. That's what's up. I'm going to close the show, Flint. We've been out here almost an hour. Mattel. Oh, man, it's been a good one, though. It is a good one. We're, we might do a, talk, a part two. We probably will. I'm going to tell people, man, if they like the video and you stayed this long, hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, share the video. Someone needs to hear it. Maybe it's your son today. With respect, Lodano Razor Wire TV. Until tomorrow, we're out.